Thank you for coming. First of all, uh, thank you for having this interview with uh, us. Pleasure. I don't know if you are uh, familiar with the Usher blocks. You, uh, I'm. You know what? I, I <laughs> first question: Do you know? Look, uh, I haven't got time to look at the news at the moment, so unfortunately no. And it's in Dutch, so I can uh, understand when you. Yes, uh, yeah, for uh, me, uh, it would be difficult because uh, yeah. My Dutch is ridiculously bad. No, you're, you're working in the Daniel, like George Nicholas. Yeah, but I'm I'm working in this building and spending I'd say over two months of my life per year outside of the country as well. So my working language is in English, um, and yeah, I can understand. Yeah, I spend all of my time speaking with two people. Yes. Yeah. Um, but my kids can speak Dutch. They go to Dutch school, and, and my wife okay. is speaking reasonable Dutch now. Uh, although she's British. They uh, hear on the school where you're kid. Yeah, 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 kids. yeah. We live in Catwalk. So in Catwalk. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So pretty, pretty Dutch, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, um, first of all, you mentioned it already. Tomorrow is a big day in the yeah. uh, with the uh, the rendezvous. Uh, it's also Valentine's Day. Is there uh, is this date uh, <laughs> chosen deliberately? I don't believe so. Um, I don't think it was specifically selected that way. I think if you actually look at the flybys, because everything's done by month. Um, in fact, again, this is all relevant to. Um, this is actually a spreadsheet of the entire mission in terms of, or since since landing. Uh, you break the mission into long-term planning periods, which are broken down into medium-term planning periods uh, of about four months. So you you cycle the orbit in such a way that you tend to try and come back to the same place to make things modular, as it were. So I think it's just it just happens that halfway through the month you tend to do a flyby. So I think, if memory serves correct, in March we'll have a far flyby, so we'll be further away and it will happen around mm. about the same time. Uh, it's just, yeah, I just think it's, sorry to spoil <laughs> the illusion. I, I, I don't know. My, my perception was that it was, it just happens to be that way. I'm not sure if colleagues in Flight Dynamics uh, in ESOC are, are that romantic to have thought of this. Uh, it may have been proposed that way, but my, my recollection is that there's no association, but we have started to make an association because You know, it is, it's a sort it's of a rendezvous nice between yeah, exactly, uh, the yeah. Rosetta and it's yeah. uh, hooking the comet. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, there was a lot of discussion about this. Whether how you describe this, whether it's appropriate to, to use certain phrases. Um, I know well, there's actually a discussion. A few people had pointed out when we, when we did our official rendezvous in August last year, when we got within a hundred kilometers, there was a discussion saying, "Yeah, but we've done this before." Well, they were saying that. Um, Deep impact had rendezvoused with a comet, and so we were saying, well, it depends your usage of the language. Whether you, if you go and rendezvous with somebody at a cafe, do you drive past in the car and throw a rock at them, <laughs> or Very do you romantic. meet them <laughs> at the same pace as they're walking, kind of thing? It's yeah. So that was the that was the, uh, the some of the discussions we've had in terms of rendezvous, but it is operationally a big event for us because we've spent most of our time in terminator orbits so away from the sunlit uh, side of the comet let, let me use yeah, the model yeah just for, for what we have in mind so basically this is the sunlit face because the back you can tell the back this is the dark side because they don't know what it looks like still um, but we've been in terminator orbits all, most of the time apart from when we were approaching Now we're going to start coming to the day side, um, and that is going to be an interesting experience for us to really feel for, for how, the, how the spacecraft is doing in terms of interacting with the gas outflow. We have a rough idea of, of how things are going. I wouldn't say rough. We have an idea when we're up here in Terminator, but not so much when we're showing all of those solar panels, all of the gas outflow. So for me, that's going to be an important uh, lesson for us to, to really get a feel for how the spacecraft is interacting with the, mm. what's coming off of the comet. The, so as well as, so, you know, in, going back to the Valentine's, it might be a, a feisty interaction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. There are several uh, streams from the uh, from the comet. Uh, yes, with yes, uh, water yeah. vapor. Is yeah. it the intention to go to fly through uh, a yet? For this, well, we may... Circumsta you know, Can you uh, maneuver it? Uh... Uh, funny you should say that, actually. Uh, in terms of operations, we are targeting to do that very operation, but we'll do it just before perihelion. 
So we, what we're doing now, we're, we're looking at observations of, of where the most active regions are, then backtracking to previous apparitions where we've looked on the ground. Uh, there's a paper by um, John Baptiste Vincent who actually was looking at the, the, the observations from the ground but then simulating where it's likely to see jets. Again, the word jet seems to be a point of contention and uh, every presentation I've seen thus far there has to be a distinct definition of what you mean by a jet but it's generally for me it's well, you, when you see the images from Osiris it's a region where you see more enhanced dust or gas so it, th this kind of thing but the point being using the previous apparitions that we've seen the, the way the activity has evolved thus far and looking at the surface itself trying to predict where we think a new active region will come and then target a co-rotational flyby through that jet, or not co-rotational, but uh, to try and get through that jet region as close, I think within about 10 or 15 kilometers to really start. so it's a dedicated mm. obs uh, set of observations that will be done there. Likely because we're within six kilometers we should uh, get within that range. In fact, <coughs> what I'll do, I can bring up the close flyby itself, at least an image of it. Again, using a tool similar to this. As if by magic, I have a presentation that I had earlier. We have to get that link, uh, Jan. <laughs> no, you're not allowed to have that one. take over the control yeah. uh... <laughs> um, I'm not sure, well, if you can have access to it, then that's great, but I'm not sure, some of them are, uh, are closed to, to the outside world. If you can steer a 2CV, you can steer a... Space group like Rosetta. Mm -hmm. So this is um, a visualization of what will happen during this flyby. I'm like, yeah. So this is actually what will happen. Okay. So this is what day is it? This is yesterday, in fact. Yeah. yeah. It's the twelfth day. I saw an animation of the uh, orbit of, of uh, Rosetta around the comet. It's not just uh, circles and then uh, approaching. It's it's a very strange. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is, it's, uh, uh, actually, this is part of the uh, part of the. This presentation that I show, I'll go to them in a minute, but yeah, because what's important, this is the beginning of the rest of the mission, as it were. We, we were in bound orbits to about 28 kilometers a couple of weeks ago. Now we've left them and we will carry out these flybys from now on. That's it. It's doing these fast flybys, these close flybys. <coughs> so you can see that I think we go over the Imatep region there. Is that right? Yeah. So we can't, yeah, we're kind of flying over this bit here, which is one of the regions that we're, we're looking at as possibly coming, becoming more active when we go, that's once we get the summer season you know, after May time periods. So, yeah, that, so we may go through some active areas, but likely, I don't think we're seeing much coming there. It's more in the neck regions at the moment and coming from uh, these areas that we're seeing from the, from the wide angle cameras. Uh, what you're alluding to, my favourite word of the day, is these these kind of legs where we fly these re and it's actually a discussion we're having at the moment trying to redesign some of these. Um, so this is actually the these the, are uh, some. Of, this is for yeah. This is for long term plane six. So this is near uh, just before perihelion, the beginning of uh, and it's what we're looking at here is having modular approach to different trajectories. So we can piece one. So this will be a close flyby or far flybys depending on how much activity we're seeing. One of the complications with the operations, and probably Fred would talk about this as well, we have to plan, we plan two levels of activity, and so we have two trajectories that we plan for at any one time. We plan for what's called a preferred case, where we predict what we believe the cometary activity will be, and then there's a backup robust case, where it's the maximum activity you could ever imagine for this kind of body, and that, we would go to that in the case that, um, if you recall, I don't know if you saw, well, let me just play this again. Um, during that, so when it does this raster, that's when it's doing its navigation scan. If the pointing, according to that, is going to, is drifting too much, the spacecraft isn't where it thinks it should be, and it will move to this high activity case. So this is why we do this plan. We have the, the one that we really scientifically want to fly, then we have the case, the height. I'm doing this because the axis is uh, activity. Um, so the high activity case is the robust safe case. It, in terms of distances, for these kind of flybys, we'd move from maybe 10 or, or 20 kilometer close flybys, closest approach, to double that. And then flying at 100, 150 instead of 75, 100. 
uh, which makes a big deal for your the observations. But it's, uh, it's decided it was decided that they're the safe distances that we'd be okay with, regardless of what happens. But this is one of the complications uh, of uh, trying to fly around a comet uh, that has some level of predictability. Mm. The there are a number of reasons which I could not recall and could not tell you exactly why um, we cannot fly in certain regions, but I've got presentations on here that were, that, that, that were uh, used to constrain all of these strange-legged orbits that we can only, up until early or late February, early March, actually get across the, the subsolar region. After that, I think there's a, there's a problem with activity that we should never... We, we, are driven by constraints on the spacecraft that would perturb certain parts of the spacecraft. So it's deemed that we can only go to about 50 degree phase angle. Mm. There are things like that. So you end up with what they call a, a, a no-fly zone, as it were, and then you start saying, well, what's the best way of doing it? So you end up with these funny square orbits to keep out of these zones in front of the comet. Um, we also have to make sure that the spacecraft is travelling at a certain speed. It can't go too slow near the comet because... Um, the ESOP guys are too worried that the comet, if something goes wrong, the spacecraft will start going towards the comet. So you have to always be thinking, if anything goes wrong at any one time, you have to make sure that the spacecraft will be escaping. Mm. So they're, they're, these are some of the, the issues. So the closest approach you have to, in certain scenarios, you have to be double the escape velocity. These, and all of these add together, um, in, as well as, <laughs> I'm not going to play it again, but as we go through the, the subsolar region, you have to flip the spacecraft round to make sure, and I can't remember which one, which side it is, one of the panels of the spacecraft should not look at or see the sun, because then there's the temperature issues, but also you'll end up with loads of shit coming off the side, because all, all of the stuff that's been in the dark all the time will suddenly start uh, sublimating. So there are, there are constraints there, you can only twist the spacecraft at a certain rate, and all of this is deemed, uh, is related to how far away you are from the comet. So that is then scaled over the year with activity as well. Yes. So all of this drives when we come out of bound orbits, when and where we can do certain orbits. And so already now we're talking about what we've learned from the bound orbit period through January. We may be able to return to bound orbits sooner than we expected. So in December, we may try and look at going back into bound orbits again, which wasn't considered uh, earlier. Mm. In, in the 10 years history of the, of the mission, nearly 11 years, there, there were more of those anxious moments. Uh, the, the awakening from hibernation last year was such a moment. Uh, but also when, when it uh, passed, uh, when it had a rendezvous with, uh, with Mars in 2007, they called it the uh, billion euro gamble. Because at the moment uh, it was in the, in the shadow of, of Mars yeah. and... Uh, can you tell more about well, that? Well, I have to say, personally, my experience with Rosetta is only is less than two years. I've only been working on the project for two years. So in 2007, I was working on that mission there, the, the, the cluster mission. Um, but I think, yeah, a lot of these, I, I say this a lot uh, in terms of, well, if we go back to last year when we had the rendezvous that I was alluding to, it wasn't as exciting, perhaps, as the, the, the wake-up or the landing. But any time you do anything with a spacecraft in space, it's it's a challenge and there's a danger. So, yeah, any flyby is going to be problematic when you've never flown that spacecraft past a body. Um, although, yeah, we have technology development levels and, and all of these kinds of things when we build a spacecraft. You never know what's going to happen, even though you've tested something 100 times, 101 mm. it might, not, it might, might not be right. You don't know whether something's going to work right. So I think, yeah, anything that's happened here... Um, with the spacecraft over the ten years has yeah. we, been we, a challenge. I mean, yeah, I mean, yes. what strikes me from somebody that's come onto the mission in the in the, the the busiest phase is the fact that it was designed to do this over ten years ago. That the mission analysis designed these orbits to do the, the the three swing bys and the Mars swing by and the two asteroid encounters, and then get within a couple of few thousand kilometers of where it was supposed to get to. Out once it got out of hibernation was quite good uh, calculation, so, you know, it's why they don't my good kids job. should do to do to stay to maths is very important. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, uh, Rosetta had already taken some uh, uh, examples of, of water vapour in August, I, uh, I believe. 
there are uh, some analyzes and from that uh, measurements they they already uh, there was a big science uh, edition uh, yeah, a month ago the, these, yes like there, yeah. um, so now they are doing new investigations new uh, analyzes so will that uh, bring perfections to the uh, Ideas that you already have. I I don't think the the actual D to H ratio will change, but it might be you know again it may be something that you see a, a change in. Uh, one of the one of the things that we're seeing is a variation. Another one of the papers that was uh, was written using the data from that same instrument, the Rosina instrument, was looking at the heterogeneity of, of the outflow. There were different gases at different times. So what does that tell you about the nucleus? So again, this is the whole point of. Uh, of Rosetta is to stay by the comet and observe if there are any changes. So if the fact that the D to H remains the same, that gives you an answer to, to, you know, that constrains things. If you see variations, maybe it says that there are, it could indicate that there are different parts of the comet. So this whole thing of the fact that whether the, 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 the comet was built of two separate entities, whether it was originally the potato shape and then this was carved out through activity, through a different um, composition, is mm. part of what we hope to find out once we've made all these measurements by the end of the year. Um, but what we'll start keying into are other ratios of other molecules as well to give us further uh, inferences of how primordial this is. I think the key thing from that result from Rosina was indicating that it is a Kuiper Belt object. It's a classical and therefore meaning it's very old. So then any other measurement we get from it, we can put into context with that to say, yes, it's pretty primordial. It comes from very early in the solar system's evolution. Maybe it predates, some of the material may predate the, the, the solar system. So it was pre-nebula, pre as it were. That's all ongoing. So yeah, that, that, that science issue was kind of to draw a line. How, this is how I perceive it. It's to say, this is what we knew when we arrived. Now we get to observe this evolution as we go in time. And that's the key thing, you know. Mm. I was just talking to somebody, or well, we're talking about with one of the graphic artists, yeah, um, <clears throat> looking at this, uh, the Thomas paper, which is, you know, the, 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 the morphology paper, which there are five classifications of different regions depending on whether they're flat, whether they've got boulders, whether they have certain plateaus, and trying to visualize this. And it would be, it could be that some of the and in fact it should be, that some of this stuff disappears. So all these boundaries will change because of activity that once we go through perihelion. So this is all part of uh, why we're there. Yes. And um, in the neck of the, uh, the comet they've seen a crack, uh, a big fissure. Yes. So uh, is, it, is there a possibility that, that the comet will split apart? Uh, I think the answer is yes, there is a possibility. We've seen it with previous with, yes. comets. Yeah, we've had mm. some comets that were comet in the century and then disappeared quite quickly when they went near the sun. So it is a possibility. The, there are a couple of discussions saying whether or not it's a stress fracture. Um, I think the last, one of the last uh, inferences in one of these papers was that it, it, it possibly is something to do with the lobes, that it is, again, something to do with stress. Mm -hmm. It will certainly make the plans I was discussing <laughs> will throw all of that out the window, I think, if that does happen. So yeah. Rosetta, I hope it doesn't break up. I know, I think Jean-Pierre Biebring, the, the camera PI from, from the lander, had stated, yeah, it would be good if the, la if the comet splits in two. I don't think it would be good, because we will have to move away. Yeah, you have a problem. Uh, yeah. there, there's all, uh, Fila is on the small side, uh, I think. Yeah. Uh, so then you have the question, is it possible that Rosetta can... Uh, rem uh, uh, well, in stay contact in with it, uh, I think, but basically, if you have a body splitting apart underneath you, and then I go to the mission manager down in and 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 and, and also the, the 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 operations guys say yeah we really want to get close to that one they go we're not going anywhere near <laughs> no, this no, no. this is splitting apart we will again because the first mind is to make sure the spacecraft can continue doing what it's doing mm -hmm. and is always the eternal battle that i fight is to say yeah but the reason we have the spacecraft in the first place is to t try and do science and the, the the biggest challenge we have especially with this spacecraft is to do the science you want to get as close as possible, but the body you're trying to get close to doesn't want you to get anywhere near it, and is especially around August time with perihelion, is pushing you away as well. So this is the eternal discussion that is had, and in fact, what I spent most of today talking about as well with my colleagues in uh, Madrid and uh, in, in Germany, to try yeah. and say, what can we do here? Can we do this? What if we do this differently? Um, and everyone's heads exploding because then you see the, the ripple effect on schedule and everyone, you know, weekends disappear. Um, 
Don't drink my car. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, regarding uh, Philae, it's, it's uh, well, we all assume it's, it's in sort of uh, sleeping mode uh, on, on the. It's hibernating, as hibernating. it was designed to do. Uh, yes. It just wasn't designed to hibernate in a ditch. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, so, okay, I, I, I'm probably. Um, I'm a, 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 bit, a glass of beer is half full rather than half empty person. Um, so, I consider that it was a good thing what happened. Um, that we've obtained samples from multiple points across the comet, that we, we, we've ended up somewhere that we could never have targeted. The mm -hmm. fact that what we're seeing from the Shiva cameras, from Rolis as well, the, the camera on the bottom of the, uh, of the lander, is really seeing primordial material that we wouldn't have seen if we'd been landed in the middle of the, the plane, as it were. Um, but the design of the, the lander, the operations were to have a separation, descent and landing, um, which speaks for itself, and the first science sequence. Now, the first science sequence was modified, obviously, but then after that you had the long-term science. But between the first science sequence and the long-term science, there was always going to be a hibernation. It was designed to do that. It's just that because it's in a ditch with a cliff, um, with no and it's on lights. one side, there's, you know, there's discussions as whether it's an hour to four hours. I always lose track of whether it's an hour or four hours in terms of illumination or how much usable illumination there is. So yeah, it's it's low illumination conditions, which means it hasn't got enough to kick it back on again, to, to, mm. to, to boot up again. It will get, we believe, in about May time period, as I was alluding to before, seasonally the rotation of the comet will be such that we start to see these, these parts of the comet. And if I bring this tool up, um, you'll see it in the planning. We can see when we fly through, when we do these trajectories through perihelion, you actually see this side of the comet. We think it's around about here somewhere, I think. If I'm right in saying, um, so it nearly went over the edge. That will come into more illumination in around May, we believe, just basically okay. that part of the comet. And there you would say, okay, by May it's getting better illuminated, and then as you're getting close to the sun, you get a higher intensity of uh, solar okay. energy. But when, when the comet uh, approaches the sun, uh, it will also develop a coma. Well, it's the, coma, the coma's there already, uh, and some of, the, some, of the, some of the colleagues who've been looking at at least um, from the perspective of the atmosphere that they sit. They don't believe that will be an issue in terms of... It's not, of, a, it's a, not a, a fog. No, no, no. It's, I mean, in some... I can't remember the illumination. So, uh, Mark McCochran was uh, talking about this in terms of what your light uh, intensity is. You know, even with fog, it's still quite bright and still you're still able to, to, to power things. It's, you know... It's, Although many many times here it's uh, it doesn't seem that way <laughs> with the cloudy skies, um, but in terms of um, modelling what the coma, how the coma should develop, and given the the, the, the the path of light from the sun through the coma, that doesn't appear to be a problem uh, in terms of yeah there'll be enough coming through, but then you have to add on to that. I'm looking at that. Could it could even help. Well, in some sense, it, yeah, you, then you'll get more diffuse light yeah. rather than direct. Yeah, uh, this this is one of the things. I think it's not an issue. It's more because basically because it's on one side. I think they've rotated it so that you see that you have a little bit more. You also have to try and think about, or this is one of the things that if if you had a better idea of where it was sitting, you might be able to see where shadows are cast on, on, the, on the solar panels as well. We have a rough idea from what we see from the, 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 the housekeeping data from each of the panels, but one of the issues you have with spacecraft, uh, with these solar panels, they're, they're put in strings. So if you have a shadow over a couple of those bottom parts of that string, the whole string won't work. It's just the electronics of it. So that's how you'll lose certain parts of the, the whole solar panel mm. because of the shadowing locally. But again, going back to in, in May, Things should be okay for it to come back on. Give, hopefully, it survived the the temperatures where it is. Um, you know, it's all it's all it's all to happen at the moment. Um, let me. Uh, yes. Out. Sorry. Hi, Maud. Could I call you back? I'm in an interview at the moment. Yeah, call cool. Cheers, mate. That was one of my colleagues from the Science Band Seven in Spain. <laughs> Maud, she's actually she's one of the liaison scientists who was working with the lander, or is working with the lander team. She's now focusing on the archive, so she's probably asking me a question about the archive. 
which is the next thing. With all type of shit on. No, this is more, the, this is the data archive. So this is... Um, you know, not not the archive... Uh... This is where you'll start to go and get your Osiris images, where you'll get all of that data when it starts coming out in the next few months. That's basically the thing that we're trying to okay. get, get ready, uh, waiting for the delivery of certain instruments. About Osiris, that's a, a thing. Uh, the, the, the team of Osiris, uh, uh, they uh, decided to uh, to make the photos not public. Well, I wouldn't say they decided. It's something that we have on the mission called a proprietary data period. Um, you could also look on the internet and see how much magnetic field data that we've put out. There's not much out there at all. The Osiris, and this is something. Um, I've learned in the last two years, <coughs> I'm a plasma physicist, I'm not interested in pictures at all. I, I look at stuff, I know it's terrible. Uh, in fact, I spent most of my career fighting or, you know, being partisan against missions that had images because I think, ah, it's, you know, images it's just a picture. Um, sorry. Uh, but now I'm on Rosetta. I, def I defend, yeah, that's it, I'll give it back now. I told you to wait till the end. <laughs> um, no, but... Those, 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 yeah, but those pictures are the Osiris team's data, and by one picture you can do science, and this is a difficult situation to be in, and I'm in the middle of this situation because I have to defend uh, the Osiris team science rights, uh, as, I, as I was saying at the beginning, that there is a proprietary data period agreed on Rosetta. There's six months from, well, it's six months from when they came down on, mm. on the ground. Uh, it's a bit complicated with respect to the landing, but it's basically six months. So by about May time should be where these the first data comes out, and that is what's going to happen. Inside of that, 10, 20 years ago, that was how it was decided. In fact, it was it used to be longer. It used to be a, a year, and this is nominal for a lot of missions, not just ESA ones, for, for NASA ones as well. My uh, area, my ex where I come from, from the plasma area, it tends to be a bit more, you can have data go out quicker, but then you really have to know what you're doing with, with that data, with magnetic field data, with electric field data, with, with uh, electron and ion spectrometers. The, the issue is that with, um, with Osiris and, and imager data, it's easier to analyze. And this is, I, I, I have to be careful how, how I make this statement. It's easier accessibility to the science within that data because it is an image, and you can make your, you know, <coughs> is it to there's a duck. Right? Other scientists from it, stealing I the, the say, glory in, of in the some digital. sense, it, it's basically the amount you, you're, you're protecting the investment of that team, of yes, that institute, of, of all the scientists around the world who have worked on that instrument for yes. many years to enable them to do the science first. Yes. Because you can imagine if you. You know, I don't know, if, if with your article here, if, if you put it together and you've made the effort to come and talk to myself and, and, and to Fred, and then somebody yes. takes that and then puts their name on the bottom of it, and then <laughs> so it's that kind of thing. But there's also, yes. the, the, there is, and I'm fully aware of this, the want for people to get involved, to see these images. Uh, and that's why there's been a, how can I put it? A lot of interactions internally uh, with Osiris to try and see where we can find a happy medium with respect to releasing the NavCam images because that's something yeah, to at least allow public uh, friendly uh, more more. Uh... Well, I mean, <laughs> it's a problem having to wait for six months. Well, is, well is there, this is, is this instrument. It's, it's instrument. yeah, but then some people really, really, really want to have the Osiris data now. They want to have all of it, and I think and yeah, there's a fine balance. The Osiris team. Well, blah, blah, blah. that's that's a whole other kind of hello. Uh oh, oh really? timekeeper. Oh. Oh.